Hello, everyone. This is the 96th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles and the Soccer Nostalgia blog, and I am joined by Paul from Shipley in England and the 1888 Letter blog. For this episode, we welcome back Argentine journalist Mr. Nacho Di Mari as we discuss the Argentina national team matches under Cesar Luis Menotti in the year 1978. We aim to have a series of interviews with Mr. Di Mari as we examine the Cesar Luis Menotti era as uh, Argentina national team manager. Welcome, Nacho. Hello. Let's get to the year 1978. So What a year. Yes. So as the year started, what was the state of things with the national team? You know that it was, every everybody was talking about the World Cup. The World Cup in 1978 was something special for Argentina. Not only, uh, I, I'm not only speaking about sports or football, but of the image of Argentina in all. And there was, as usual, I, I may say, a lot of doubts about the team, even if uh, Menotti was working very hard uh, from four years by that time, or three, to be precise. And there was a lot of expectation about the, the national team and, and, and the World Cup in all the levels, organization and, and everything. So everybody was talking about the World Cup in, in 1978. Next point, did the press feel confident about Argentina's World Cup chances? Uh, I think that... At the beginning, I think that it, it's difficult to, to say if all the press. There was some part of the press that, as usual, uh, they were not behind Menotti and, and that. But I think that the, the majority of, 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 the, of the press w- was thinking that Argentina will make a, an important World Cup. I don't know if, if, if it became a world champion. But to finish in the, the last four, for example, we have to, to remember that in uh, four years after, in 1974, Argentina made a, a very poor World Cup in Germany. So even if we were at our World Cup, the improvement had to be uh, noticed in the matches, during the matches, the matches. We have to mention the political situation with the military junta led by General Videla. On our Mm -hmm. last podcast, we mentioned there were growing concerns over the capabilities uh, of the organizers. Was there Mm -hmm. any such concern that you remember being there yourself? No, really. I think that at that time I was 12 12 years old and I didn't remember to be concerned about what was happening really. Even though I think that the the organization was very strict because that was the image not only for Argentina but for the military government. So they I think that they put everything, every effort there just to say to the world we are doing well things. It's very difficult sometimes to... I think that we have to... We have two different things. The sports and the politics. The, the political issue was very difficult, of course. But at that time, precisely, uh, I think that the government tried to look as a very good government. And they... They made every effort to to build the stadiums or rebuild the stadiums just to have the capability of, of host the World Cup in a very good form. And there were also demands by some European political intellectuals from uh, a few of the participating nations to actually boycott the tournament. Did did that um, register in Argentina? Was that was that 
discussed at the time? You know that the press uh, also was uh, supervised by the political, by the military government. So we, we try to show what we need to at that time. Uh, I remember the spot magazine El Grafico, that's the most important magazine of, of uh, the history here in Argentina. Um, they were showing how good we were, how good the military was. And I, I remember a letter that was published in one of those numbers during the World Cup that was seen by Ruth Kroll, who was the Dutch captain at, at that time, saying that the military were good. They were, instead of wearing rifles, they were wearing flowers and that kind of things that we know that was not the really thing that was happening, but at that time was what the government wanted to uh, to give to the world, to the rest of the world. I, I remember also that, for example, Johan Cruyff didn't want to play here in Argentina, and, and he was, uh, at that time, he was, the, I think, that, the most important player uh, in activity, but he didn't want to come here to Argentina. I, I remember that. Can you discuss the exclusions of former captain Jorge Carascosa and Hugo Gatti, the goalkeeper? About Gatti, that was something that Menotti decided he wanted to to play with Filiol. Filiol was at a very high level at that time. He was playing in, in River Plate. He became champion in 1975, twice, uh, 76-2, 77-2. He was at a very, very top level. And I think that he earned to be the, goal, the first goalkeeper, the first choice as goalkeeper. Hugo Gatti was uh, very particular, so uh, all, all his life it's very strange. Uh, he's called the mad, a loco, Gatti. And uh, I think that he didn't want to be second for Filiol or for anybody else. He wants to be the number one. He usually says nowadays, too, that he was the, the most important goalkeeper in Argentina. In part, it's right, he was very special, but uh, Menotti decided to play with, with uh, Filiol, and he was right in his decision, of course. And Carrascosa, that was uh, something different. He was the former captain in the team. He played uh, the series, in we remember in the, our last podcast, in 1977 against the European teams. But then he decided not to play anymore for the national team because of the military government. There were some reports that in addition to the reasons that you specified, there were issues with the bonus payments that had been agreed upon with the foreign based players, but not with the rest of the home based players. And also... I think Gatti had requested to join the February training camp that was in Mar del Plata like a month later because he felt yes. he was not fully fit. And he had he had suggested he would train with his club, Boca Juniors, and then join the squad. Argentine Federation doctor had examined him and passed him to be fit. And as a result, Menotti excluded him from the squad and called up La Volte uh, as a replacement. Yes, the, the, the three goalkeepers that finally made it to the World Cup were Filiol, Ballet, who was called surname Chocolate, Chocolate Ballet, and La Volte. At that time, I remember that the players stay with the national team. I don't remember. It was two months earlier. That's, that's a lot of time. And perhaps Gatti was 
not wanting to have a, uh, so much time spending with the national team and he wanted to play with Boca. He was the, perhaps at that time the most important player uh, Boca had. And I think that Menotti, what he wanted was to have the players for him. It doesn't matter why. I, I remember that there was some kind of forbidden list of selling players. There was a list of players that were forbidden to be sold to the European teams. The only European player at that time, if I'm not mistaken, is, uh, was uh, Mario Alberto Kempes, who was playing in Spain at Valencia. But all the other players were uh, from Argentina. That was very dif different as nowadays that we have the most parts of the players playing outside and only, for example, in the last World Cup, only Armani was from Argentina. Yes, and to remind everyone uh, what you mentioned, we discussed in a previous podcast, there was a transfer embargo set by the Federation, a list of non-transferable players. Yes, I think that there were 14 players that were selected not to be sold to teams in, in outside from Argentina. And with very big names, of course, Luque, uh, Passarella, Tarantini, who was not playing at Boca at that time because he was with some kind of trouble. And he was, uh, I think, Paul, it was going to be playing in Birmingham, if I'm not That's missing. The next season. Yeah, the next season. Right. Okay, yeah. so yeah. 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 so he was he was with a uh, with some kind of trouble with the um, the team in Boca Juniors, and he decided not to sign his contract. So he was as a free agent uh, in in the list of of the national team. And there was also the situation of Ruben Galvan and Omar La Rosa. Uh, they had received suspensions of 15 and 20 matches, respectively, for attacking a referee, uh, which would have kept them out of the World Cup. How did Minotti manage to convince the Federation to make them available? That I, I think that Min Minotti was, is very clever. And I think that he, he may be able to show the Federation, that those players were very important. Uh, even though La Rosa, he, he, he was uh, one of the... He usually was in the, in the 11 team. He played the, 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 the last match against the, the Dutch team. And I think that Menotti was... Well, he always was a, a very intelligent man. I think that he, he has the, the ability to to show everybody what he needs and perhaps say that with that uh, players, he will be able to reach the final at, at, at least. Yes. So, in fact, the Federation rewrote its rules to have them available by the time of the World Cup. And as a result, the six-man disciplinary committee, they quit in protest for this decision. It's something the Argentine Football Federation, or La AFA, as we know it here, it's very um, rare. We, we, they usually uh, change the laws in, in course of the seasons. <laughs> For example, nowadays they, they say that there is going to be two teams who are going to go down to the second division and perhaps in the middle of the season, they say, no, okay, it's only one that is going to go. But, well, uh, we are aware of that. Now let's get to the first friendlies of the year just ahead of the World Cup. In March 1978, as part of the Copa Ramon Castilla, Argentina faced Peru home and away. In the interest of saving time, I will not go through all the lineups of these pre-World Cup friendly matches. Needless to say, all this information will be provided in the compendium that I will upload on my blog. Let's go to the first match. On March 19, Argentina hosted Peru at La Bombonera. 
Argentina would win 2-1. Hausman scored in the 41st minute and uh, international debutant Ruben Paganini of Independiente scored a second in the 66th minute. And Percy Rojas scored in the 88th minute for uh, Peru. So for this match, in addition to Paganini, Victor Botanis of Union Santa Fe and Umberto Bravo of Taleres de Cordoba also made their international debuts. A few days later, on March 19th, Argentina traveled to Lima and faced Peru. So Argentina would win this match 3-1. Luque scored in the 7th minute. Pasarela scored a penalty kick in the 25th minute. And Hausman scored in the 29th minute. And Juan Oblita scored Peru's goal in the 53rd minute. From the foreign-based players, Menotti only requested Mario Kempes. This is before the, his final cut. He requested Mario Kempes, Osvaldo Piazza, and Enrique Wolf. In the end, Kempes was the only one in the final squad. Can you discuss yes. the reasons why uh, Piazza and Wolf missed out? Yeah, Piazza had um, a familiar problem. I think that his wife had an accident, a car accident here in Argentina. He was playing at the time at saint Etienne in France. He was one of the most important players of, of, of that team who reached the European Cup Finals against Bayern Munich a couple of years uh, before. He, he was a very top player, but his wife had an accident, a car accident, and he decided uh, not to join the national team and, and stay behind his wife. As far as Wolf, the reports that Real Madrid did not release him in time, and his wife was also expecting a baby, so he had family reasons that's, as well. That's right. Wolf was one of the most important players in the World Cup in Germany four years before. He was a player in, in, in a high level also because he, he played at that time in Real Madrid. I think that the negotiations with the teams were very different from what we are seeing now. And also the players, perhaps, they didn't have the ability to press the, the, the teams to decide what they wanted. Nowadays, you know that if one player wants to join the national team, he will, he will do it, yes. uh, no matter what. At that time, it, it, it was something very, very different. Uh, and I remember that uh, Menotti was very, very concerned about Kempes because he thought that he will become one of the most uh, important players of, of that team. Piazza and Wolf were requested to be in Argentina by March 15th, when the season is still going on in Europe. And Campus was authorized to finish the season with Valencia because he knew Menotti's methods well enough. So that's would... right. He thought that Campus will be the, the the key player. So it doesn't matter. It didn't matter to him if he was not all all those days that he wanted to initially. You touched on the, the strange contractual situation of Alberto Tarantini, uh, the first, perhaps the only player to win the World Cup as a free agent. So <laughs> he didn't have a club, but how important was he to the team and Minotti's plans? He, he was very important. He was a, a, a key player also. He was a young player at that time. And for the, the football analysis of, of Menotti, he was very important for, for the right uh, defender and the left defender. Uh, that was Olin on the right and Tarantini on the left. They were very important because they used to attack a lot and they used to have a very good ability with the ball. He chooses players with the ability to can manage to take the ball from where they are to the top to the top of, of the team. 
And uh, for example, Passarella, uh, he was a, a, a very talented defender, uh, not also because he was a great defender, but when he used to attack, he was very important. Garantini in the left and Dolgin on the right, they also do that because Minotti want that in his teams. Carrascosa, for example, in the, the, the national team and in Huracan, where he played with Menotti, he also was very important defending and attacking too. Let's take a look at the final friendly matches that Argentina played before the World Cup and as Menotti is finalizing the squad. So on March 29th at La Bobonera, Argentina defeated Bulgaria. Americo Gallego scored in the ninth minute, Oscar Ortiz in the 13th minute, and Osvaldo Ardiles in the 66th minute. And Nikolai Grancharov scored for Bulgaria in the 35th minute. On April 5th, uh, again at La Bombonera, Argentina defeated Romania 2-0, with Passarela scoring twice in the 20th and the 83rd minute. Next, on April 19th, in an unofficial friendly, Argentina defeated the League of Ireland 11 again at La Bombonera. Lucas scored in the 16th minute, Ortiz in the 46th, and Ricardo Villa in the 55th minute. And Simon Bradish scored for Ireland 11 in the 66th minute. So on April 25th at uh, Montevideo at Estadio Centenario, Uruguay defeated Argentina 2-0. Ildo Manero scored in the 64th minute and Fernando Morena in the 80th minute. This will be the last matches for Botanis. This was his third cap in only 1978. Umberto Bravo, this will be his fourth cap in 19, only 1978. And also Ruben Paganini. Again, this was his fourth cap only in 1978. In addition... This was the seventh and final cap for Ruben Galvan. He had made his debut in 1973. As well as Daniel Killer. This was his 22nd and final cap. His first cap had been 1976. So the final friendly before the World Cup would be on May 3rd at La Bobonera, Argentina, hosting Uruguay. And this time, Argentina would win 3-0. Luque scored in the 21st minute, Ardiles in the 60th minute, and Norberto Alonso in the 90th minute. So now let's take a look at the final 22, selected by Cesar Luis Menotti. At number one, we have Norberto Alonso of River Plat. Uh, let me let let me add something. This was very was very funny because the Argentine team was the numbers were selected alf in alphabetical order. Yes. So you will find Alonso, who was usually number ten in in River Plate, with the number one. That was very in this World Cup and in in Spain eighty two. Also, Argentina made that decision, or Menotti took that decision. Yes, in 82, Ardiles was number one. That's right, yes. Looking at the squad, number one, we have Norberto Alonso of River Plate. Number two, Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan. Number three, backup goalkeeper Hector Ballet of Huracan. Number four, striker Daniel Bertoni of Independiente. Number five, starting goalkeeper Ubaldo Filol of River Plate. Number six, Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Number seven, defender Luis Galvan of Taleres Cordoba. Number eight, in midfield, Ruben Galvan of Independiente. Number nine, forward Rene Hausman of Huracan. Number 10, Mario Campes of Valencia in Spain. Number 11, defender Daniel Killer of Racing Club. Number 12, midfielder Omar Larroza of Independiente. Number 13, another goalkeeper, 
Ricardo Lavolpe of San Lorenzo, future Mexico national team manager. Number 14, Leopoldo Luque of River Plate. Number 15, defender Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo. Number 16, striker Oscar Ortiz of River Plate. Number 17, midfielder Miguel Oviedo of Taleres. Number 18, in defense, Ruben Paganini of Independiente. Number 19, in defense, captain of the team, Daniel Alberto Passarella. Number 20, in defense, Alberto Tarantini. We mentioned a free agent. Number 21, Jose Valencia of Taleres. And number 22, Ricardo Villa of Racing Club. From the players who didn't make the final cut, there are the likes of obviously Osvaldo Piazza, we mentioned, Hugo Villaverde, Ricardo Boccini, another independent player. Even Boccini's absence in the February training camp had also made some news. We have to mention about a teenager, Diego Armando Maradona, who was also <laughs> cut. There was a lot of clamor for him to be in the team. What was Menotti's reasoning and uh, Maradona's reaction to the decision over the years? At that time, I think that, of course, Maradona was very young. He was, uh, I think, 18, 18 years yeah. old. Yes. And I think that Menotti even thought he, was, he, he knew that he was uh, a very special player. I think that he tried to to keep the team with the base players that were playing more time with with him, as attacking middle first, middle fields and strikers. He select a lot of very good players. Nobody complained, Luque. Nobody complained, Ortiz. Nobody complained about Kempes, Bertoni, Postman. They were very important players at that time in their team. So Maradona, he was recently starting play uh, playing football, uh, I think, from two years. Uh, and even if he was becoming a, a very special player, at that precisely time, I think that it was not a very big issue that he was not retained to play in the World Cup. I think that Menotti was, at that time, perhaps he was as a father for Maradona. He knew that he will have his chance afterwards. I remember um, an article in El Grafico that was Maradona, a photo of Maradona crying at that time when he realized that he will not be in the, in the 22 for the World Cup a very paternalistic consolation from, from Menotti at that time. Let's get to the World Cup. Argentina were in a group with Hungary, France, and Italy. They started a World Cup on June 2nd against Hungary at Buenos Aires at Estadio Monumental, that of the River Plate. So for this match, we have the following lineup. Filol. Galvan, Olguin, Passarella, Tarantini, Ardiles, Gallego, Rene Hausman. He replaced by Norberto Alonso in the 75th minute. Kempes, Luque, and Jose Valencia. And he replaced by Daniel Bertoni in the 67th minute. It was an ill-tempered match and two Hungarians were sent off. Hungary took the lead in the 10th minute through Karoli Zsapo. Zombori's shot was parried by Filiol and Zsapo knocked in the rebound. Argentina tied the match in the 15th minute. An indirect free kick from Kempes was parried by the Hungarian goalkeeper Gujdar and Luque knocked in the rebound. Argentina would have to wait until the 83rd minute to score the winner. Combination play, Luque 
enters the goal area and passed across to the right for Bertoni to struck in. So Argentina won this first match to get the World Cup on track. I remember that there was a lot of expectations for, for the first match, of course. A bit disappointed because Argentina didn't play a very good uh, match. But I remember that the entrance of Alonso was a very good one because she was involved in, in the second goal that scored Bertoni. Even so, the, the TV thought that it was Alonso who scored because he was in that, uh, in that play and, and he, he managed to give the ball. We said here, uh, Taquito, he played with the, with, with the soul. He gave the ball to Bertoni and that was the, the goal that gave the victory to Argentina. I remember that after the match, uh, the press was thinking if Alonso may have the, the chance to be in the first team, in the 11 team, in the, in the next match against uh, France. Because, as I said before, it was very important what he did in that, uh, I don't know, uh, last part of the match. So a few days later, at the same venue on June 6th, Argentina faced France. This was a France, including a young Michel Platini and other familiar names like Batiston, Bossis, Bernard Lacombe, Rosto, Didier Six. And... Didier Six, yes. yes. I remember Platini was with the number 15. Yes, yes, indeed. For this match, Argentina started with Philol, Galvan, Olguin, Passarella, Tarantini, Ardiles, Gallego, Hausman, Kempes, Luque, and Valencia. And he'd be replaced by Norberto Alonso in the 64th minute, who in turn was injured and replaced by Oscar Ortiz in the 71st minute. In fact, Argentina were reduced to 10 men afterwards when Luque was also injured and had to play with one less man for the rest of the match. So mm -hmm. for this match, Argentina takes the lead just before halftime through a controversial penalty kick awarded uh, that was scored by Daniel Passarella. It was a hand that from Tresor. Yes. So basically, and he Pasarela. slipped and fell down, and his hand touched the ball, and the yes. penalty was awarded. And yes. I guess at this point, Luke was, I think Luke was pressuring him when he fell. Yeah. That's right. So Argentina takes the lead, and uh, in the 58th minute, the French goalkeeper, Jean Paul Bertrand de Mont, he attempts to save a shot from Valencia. As he does that, he his shoulder strikes the post. So yes. he's injured and he's replaced by Dominic Baratelli for the rest of the match. But France, just two minutes later, Platini ties the match for France. Yeah, I remember it was a, a ball that came that came in the in the crossbar. Yes. And Platini then scored. Yeah, so it was a lock home shot. He loved the ball. It struck the bar. And then, yeah, Platini scored from the rebound. Argentina would take the lead in the 73rd minute. From the middle, Ardiles passed to Luque, who was well outside of the box. And he lifted the ball and struck a beautiful volley from long range and um, scored Argentina's winner. Well, I, I remember a lot that match. It was a very tough one because France, they lost their first match against Italy. They played in Mar del Plata that first match. And surpri surprisingly, they, they started winning. It was the goal from Lacombe for, was at the first minute, I thought. I think they were with the last chance to uh, at least tie it with, with Argentina. I remember that when Platini tied the match, there was uh, some kind of concern 
with the the supporters in in the Estadio Monumental. And I remember goal of Golazo, we may say, of uh, Luque, who, you know, that at that time he was injured in, in his eye because he received, an, I think, that an, a, 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 um, an elbow from, yes, from another French player. And also he was with blood in his, in his shirt and he had lost his brother a couple of days after the match. He was very concerned about that. He was crying that he wanted, he, he, he spoke with uh, Menotti at that time saying that he wanted to play for his brother. And he scored that magnificent goal. On June 10th at uh, El Monumental, Argentina faced Italy. Now, at this point, both teams had won their first two matches and the winner of this match would be the winner of this group. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to add that the one who was uh, who we lost that match, we had to go to play to Rosario instead of continue playing in Buenos Aires in, in River Plate Stadium. Yes. So uh, for Argentina, it was very important at the beginning to maintain as lead of, of the group just to continue playing in real play. Yes. That was very important. As far as Italy, this was a team that would have the backbone of the team that would win the World Cup in 1982. Mm -hmm. We have the likes of Dino Zoff, Cabrini, Gentile, Shirea, Antonioni, Tardelli, and Paolo Rossi. Mm -hmm. So for this match, Argentina started with Filol, Galvan, Olguin, Passarella, Tarantini, Ardiles, Gallego, Bertoni started for the first time, Kempes, Ortiz, he'd be replaced by Hausman in the 72nd minute, and, uh, and Valencia. Luque missed this match through injury. Now, this match... Italy would win 1-0 with Roberto Betega scoring in the 67th minute. As you said, Argentina had to go to Rosario for the second round. That's right. I remember the, the goal was a combination between Paolo Rossi and Betega. Yes. It was very difficult at, at the time because, as I said before, Argentina or Menotti wanted to, to be lead of the group just to stay in Buenos Aires in the concentration place that he carried on all the preparation. To go to Rosario, that was something unexpected. I remember also that uh, the press started speaking about Kempes because he, he passed the first, the first matches in the group without scoring and even without playing in, in a very good form. So everybody was speaking about if Kempes was good enough to be in the starting eleven. Alonso was injured in, in the match against uh, France and was not uh, with the capability of, of restart, I think, in all, all the, the rest of the cup. Yes, uh, Argentina may have been disappointed to go to Rosario, but at least this this is where Mario Kempes would come to life for the World Cup. That's right, that's right, because he used to play in Rosario Central, and the stadium that was selected there was exactly the stadium of Rosario Central. That was his stadium. Yeah. So in this second round, Argentina is in a group with Brazil, Poland, and Peru. Yes, so it was different at, at, at nowadays. There was another group after the, the, the first groups. There was no quarterfinal or, or that. Yeah, it, it was the same have. format as in 1974 World Cup as well. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So 
for the first match in the second round, Argentina as a Rosario. And uh, on June 14th, they face Poland. And this is a Poland with the likes of Jan Tomaszewski, Zmuda, Dana, a young Zbigniew Boniek, Lato, and Jarma. Very good team. Very good team. That they were third in the World Cup in, in Germany. Yes. So for this match, Luque is still out. So Argentina starts with Filol, Galvan, Olgin, Passarella, Tarantini, Ardiles, Bertoni, Gallego, Hausman. He'd be replaced by Oscar Ortiz in the 83rd minute. Campes, Valencia, and he'd be replaced by Ricardo Villa in the 46th minute. So this match, like we said, Campes scores both of Argentina's goals. This is basically the reference match as far as Argentina having the form to become World Cup champions. In the 16th minute, Bertone crossed like from the middle and Campes headed it in. He broke his duck and uh, started scoring regularly after this. So mm-hmm. in the 37th minute, Poland had a goal bound shot towards the goal and Campes saved it with a handball. Yes. And Poland it, it was even better. It was even better than Filiol at that time. <laughs> yeah. Poland are awarded a penalty kick in the 37th minute. And at this point, they can tie the match and who knows what the rest of the match would be. Mm-hmm. But Filo saved Dana's penalty kick and uh, galvanized Argentina further. That's they, right. Yeah. And they would score the second goal through Campes in the 71st minute. Again, from the middle, Ardiles would advance and pass to his left to Campes, who would strike in, and Argentina won this match 2-0. Yes, that was a, a very important match. The team made, a, we said here, they made a cake and they changed the... Uh, their minds, they change what they think. And I I think that at that time, they perhaps they knew that they were in a very good form and they were uh, with the capability of, of reach the finals. At that time, it, it was very important because Kempes made his first two goals of the tournament that was something that liberated him for the rest of, of it. What do you think had changed for uh, Kempes and the team to have improved from the opening round? I think that perhaps, well, the, the lucky thing that he played in, in Rosario, that it was a very important city for him in the stadium of, of Rosario Central also, it was called El, El Gigante de Arroyito. Uh, that's the name of, of the stadium, or, or as we know it. Kempes could free himself. I think that he had a lot of pressure, not, not only in the first match, but in all the tournament, because he was the player who came from a foreign team to play that uh, World Cup. So... It was very important to him to score these two goals because I think that he liberated not only him, but the rest of the team and also Menotti because Menotti could say, okay, I bring him from, I brought him from Valencia and, and now he scored and he's, this is the camp that I was expecting. The next match in the group is against rivals Brazil on June 18th at Rosario. Now, for this Brazilian team, we have the likes of Zico and Roberto Dinamite, Oscar, some familiar names, Emerson Liao in goal. This would be a very physical match. And yeah, Argentina started with Filo. Galvan, Olguin, Passarella, Tarantini, 
Ardiles, he replaced by Ricardo Villa in the 46th minute. In fact, this was Ricardo Villa's 17th and final cap for Argentina. From His first cap had been 1975. And we have Daniel Bertoni, Gallego, Kempes, Lucas back into the team, Oscar Ortiz, and he replaced by Norberto Alonso in the 60th minute. So beside all the punching and kicking, what do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> I remember that it was not a, a very good match in the means of technique. It was very tough because it's un classico. It's a classic. It's a, a derby. So neither Argentina, neither Brazil wanted to lose that match, to lose that match. And uh, I think that they wanted to preserve their defense. And if you can score, that's right. But the important was not to, to lose that match. But I think that was very important was that the match between Poland and uh, Brazil for the last match of the group that will leave Argentina uh, in the condition of scoring more goals than Brazil because uh, not winning against Brazil will mean that you have to win, uh, you have to defeat the next match, Peru, and try to score more goals than Brazil did. It, it was a, a match that I think it, the result maybe was expected, but uh, because of what I said, none of the team wanted to lose that game. So let's get to this, the, one of the most controversial matches in the history of the World Cup. On June 21st, <laughs> Argentina facing Peru at Rosario. And as you mentioned, Brazil had defeated Poland earlier in that day, 3-1. So Argentina knew that they needed at least four goals to oh. advance to the final. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to all the conspiracy theories. Argentina started with Filol, Galvan, Olgin, Passarella, Tarantini, Bertoni, he replaced by Hausmann in the 64th minute, Gallego, he replaced by Miguel Oviedo in the 85th minute, Campes, La Rosa, Luque, and Ortiz. So we all know the score. Argentina wins 6 0. Campes scores in the 21st and the 46th minute. Tarantini in the 43rd minute. Luque scores in the 50th and the 72nd minute. And Hausman in the 67th minute. This match will always be referenced for all the theories. Anything from bribes to political reasons. There's a theory about... Mm -hmm. uh, exchange of prisoners between Argentina and Peru. <laughs> so what is the view from Argentina? Well, there's, very, there's no proof at all. So we, we have a lot of theories, but no one proves anything. I remember the time that they said also that Quiroga, who was the goalkeeper uh, from Peru, he was born in Argentina. And they said that, that they spoke with Quiroga to let him down. And the, the thing is that I think that if we speak football only, I think that Argentina had the, the, the team to make four goals against Peru because they had a very good team at that uh, point of the tournament. And... I can say that in, in an Argentine way, uh, Menotti, I will say it first in Spanish, tiró toda la carne en el asador. That means that he put all the meat in, in, the, in the oven. and uh, He made the team play in a very, very good way, attacking all the time. I remember that was very crucial, the 
the second one. I, I think I, I remember especially that goal because uh, even if we were winning one one nil, that was not good enough. And at, at that point of the match, the, the goal scored by Tarantini was very, very sport important. I remember his run. I remember Tarantini celebrating his goal in a very special way, like four years later did Tardelli in, in the final match against right. Germany. He was exhausted how he's shouting and waving his hands. He scored with his head. I think it was a corner kick and, 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 and Tarantini appears. I don't remember from where, but he scored that goal that was very, very important. And in the second half, Argentina played perhaps the most beautiful game in that tournament. And also remember the, how, how Hauseman celebrated his, his uh, goal. It was a, a very po important match. I don't know if there was some kind of arrangement between the military government and the Peruvian government. Uh, let me let me stay with the 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 championship and the the sport, and let's keep out every theory about Argentina getting the match because Peru wanted to. I think that Argentina had a very good team, a very strong team, enough to beat Peru uh, by four goals or six like it finally did. I think the takeaway is that those last round matches should have been played simultaneously to keep it fair. And after this incident and the shame of Gijón in the 1982 World Cup between Austria and West oh. Germany, all these last matches in the groups were played simultaneously. I think from 90, 1986 onwards, from if I remember. That's that's fair enough. Yes, that's right. So uh, ahead of the final, there was still uh, talk of things that were going on off the pitch and the. Um, article in El Grafico that you mentioned earlier um, that was Rude Kroll or supposedly Rude Kroll's letter to his daughter um, do we know now how that came to appear in, in such a prestigious magazine and, and who was responsible for it uh, I think that yes, what, what I think is that uh, I, I'm pretty sure about that the directors of El Grafico were familiarized with the military government because, you know, it was the most important sports magazine in not only in Argentina, perhaps in South America, and one of the most important worldwide. That's obviously so. Uh, I think that what they wanted to do is to show the world that Argentina was, uh, or the military government in Argentina was not doing doing things that, or doing the things that everybody outside Argentina knew. And perhaps that letter from Ruth Kroll was very important because I remember especially that part in the in the letter where he said that instead of rifles, they had flowers. I don't know. I spoke with, with Ruth Kroll once uh, when he came here in Argentina, but I didn't, I didn't make him that question. This. Did you write that letter, Ruth? No. Let's get to the final on June 25th between Argentina and Holland at Buenos Aires at El Monumental. Let's just mention some of the players on this uh, Dutch team. You have Ruth Kroll as captain, the likes of Wim Janssen, Ari Han, the Van der Kerkhoff twins, Ransom Brink, Niskans, Johnny Rep, Brands, and a lot of good players and managed by the Austrian Ernest Happel. It was a, a very strong team. I remember that Ransom Brink scored the, it was the 1,000 goal? Yes. Of the World Cup? 
Yes. They played again in the first round. They played against Scotland. It was perhaps the, the best team because they didn't they didn't have Christ. If you if you if you add Christ to that team, perhaps it will be another history. Yeah, as far as Argentina, they started with Filol, Galvan, Olgin, Passarella, Tarantini, Ardiles. He'd replaced by Omar La Rosa in the 65th minute. This would be La Rosa's 11th and final cap. His first cap was in 1977. Bertoni, Gallego, Kempes, Luque, Ortiz, and he replaced by Hausman in the 74th minute. Now, mm -hmm. before the match kicked off, there was some controversy. It was René or René Van der René. René. René, one of the Van der Kerkhoff twins, René, was wearing a cast, a cast on his arm. Yes. And I, I remember that Passarella started speaking with the, with the referee saying that he was not able to play with uh, that in, in his arm because uh, it's, it, it was forbidden. And that delayed the, the, the start of the match. And I remember that I think that he has to use another bandage right, uh, right. To, to start playing. And perhaps that was very uh, an Argentine way to... <laughs> try to make some sounds and something strange in, in the, the middle of, of, of the starting of, of a World Cup final. But I remember that priceless,ly and I, I remember that uh, Van der Kerkhoff, the, the two of them were very important players in, in, in that Dutch team. Yeah, so in this match, we all know Argentina takes the lead in the 38th minute. On the left side, Ardiles passed to Luque, who passed across to the right to Campes to score. Very good goal. Yes. And Argentina seemed headed to victory when the Dutch tied the match in the 82nd minute. Rene van der Kerkhoff crossed from the right side and Dirk Naninga headed in the equalizer. Yes, I remember that that was a a cold bomb to Argentina and to the uh, Estadio Monumental. I think that perhaps I was crying at that time because I, I believe, oh wow, we are going to lose the the match. But it was a very intense match in during all all, all that final was very tough to play. Uh, I remember especially Passarella, who played a very, very good match. And please, remember every day that Filiol was there, because what he made that day was, I never saw it again in, in a goalkeeper in Argentina. And describe your emotion about the incident right before the end, where history could have been different. Well, in the last seconds of the match, there was a ball that received Robbie Ransombrink. And when he shot the shot, Filiol couldn't manage to stop that shot. And it was, went straight, straight to the, uh, the bar, the right, the right bar. And Perhaps at that moment, I said, okay, we, 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 we have to win this. We have to win this. Because if that ball was in, the World Cup will, will go to, to Holland at that time. I think that the, that was the, the only ball that Filiol couldn't stop. Because uh, before that, there was a, a terrific header from Johnny Rep, But... Near, very near Filiol, and Filiol could manage to stop that one. So I think that at that time I thought, okay, God is with us. 
and we are going to to win this match. So the match would go into extra time, and Argentina would take the lead in a hundred and fifth minute through Kempes scoring his sixth goal. It was Bertoni uh, and Kempes uh, are combined in this second goal, and basically after a scramble, Kempes just yes. uh, puts it in. It was it, not a very was, beautiful it, goal, but it was a key goal, you know. That yes, oh, and he 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 showed all his strength in that uh, in that uh, goal because I don't know how, but he managed to put the ball inside of the cage of uh, young blood. You have to see that goal. If you didn't see it, you have to go to YouTube and and and, and see that goal because it was very something very strange what that happened. So Argentina would score the third goal in the 116th minute. This time, Kempes from the middle, he advanced and passed to Bertoni inside the box and he turned and shot. And yes. Argentina were World Cup champions for the first time in their history. And yes, I, I, I remember that goal. There was some, so some kind of scramble between Bertoni and, and Kempes. And uh, the ball stayed at, at the left foot of Bertoni, who scored. He was a terrific striker, uh, Daniel Bertoni. He had a very good uh, career in, in Spain and in Italy. He made a very, very strong World Cup to uh, scoring that magnificent goal in the, the late minutes of the extra time. Yes, and Argentina, by winning the World Cup, they became the third South American nation joining Uruguay and Brazil to have won the World Cup. And the mm -hmm. sixth nation overall to have won the World Cup. And Mario Kempes also became the top goal scorer with six goals. Yes. So, so discuss the celebrations afterwards. At a societal level, what did this mean for Argentina? I remember that Every match, when, when the, the match finished, all the people went to the obelisco. The obelisk, it's a, a statue that we have in, in the middle of, uh, of the center of, of Buenos Aires. It's very characteristic here in Argentina to celebrate there. And the people was floating in the streets. They were the horns of the car that you listen continuously. Uh, I live in a neighborhood at that time that it's called Belgrano. And I remember everybody going to the, 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 the avenue uh, called Cabildo. Uh, everybody there shouting horns of the car with the, the joy. Uh, it was very, very special because of what Argentina was living, perhaps politically, this was something important to the people in Argentina, not only to the military government who wanted to keep that victory for them. This was for the people in Argentina, really. And uh, I remember that everybody was uh, laughing, crying. There was some something very, very intense. Do you remember if there were any survivors from Argentina's previous World Cup final in 1930, still around at this point, and what their reaction might have been? Yes, there were. I don't remember the, the their reaction. I remember that in the TV, because it was not like nowadays that you have instantly the reaction of everybody at the same time because of uh, Twitter, threads, uh, Facebook, and the TV and radio and YouTube. It was very different at that time. Uh, we, we are all, we, we three, we are all. So we know what we was to see a World Cup or to leave a World Cup in 1978, it was very diff different as we can live a World Cup uh, nowadays. There was no, no streaming 
all was from the public TV, and that was what you get. That was you. You now you if you want to see a match at the TV, perhaps you have five, six different ways to see it. At that time, it was only one transmission, at, and I, I don't remember especially if there were a special celebration for for the the players that still lived at that time and uh, played the, the the match against Uruguay in 1930 but i i, I remember that uh, as i said before all the the people in argentina was very 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 happy of uh, winning this world cup Let me ask you this, Paul. This victory certainly had a bearing on the history of English football. It would have been unthinkable for the transfers of Ardiles and Villa to Tottenham to take place without this title. What are your thoughts, especially since you wrote about the history of Argentine players in the English league on your blog? Yeah, it's another reminder that th- this was a different world. It's um, you know, it's it's such a big event for for English football that just that summer, um, the the ba- the ban that had been imposed for you know the best part of a century on uh, foreign players in English football was lifted, and there just there just weren't foreign players in the in the football league at that time. Uh, and for it to be the world champions, it really couldn't have been bigger. But there were still a lot of people who were very dubious about how our dealers and Via would adapt, how they would cope with the change of climate, the language, the English playing conditions. Uh, but of course they did. Um, Via is always remembered for his goal to win the 1981 FA Cup. And our dealers was still playing right at the end of the 80s into the early 90s. He managed clubs. He he had such a big impact. And that World Cup brought a lot of attention, obviously, on Argentina for the, for the whole world. And once it became known that players might be available, um, Sheffield United tried to sign Maradona, eventually signed Alex Sabella. Uh, Tarantini, as we mentioned, came to Birmingham for a spell. Claudio Marangoni came to Sunderland Marangoni. this year, so it was it was the start of of South American players in England and and foreign players in general, really. And yeah, absolutely, those players paved the way, changed English football. Yes, and uh, as far as Ricardo Villa, in the in my research, I came across this report in World Soccer that. Apparently, earlier in the year, in 1978, there was a group in Texas that was attempt- attempting to launch a NASL team. And they had wanted to sign Villa. And his club was desperate in cash. And they wanted him to be dropped from the World Cup squad so could, so they could sell him to the, uh, I guess, the consortium in Texas trying to launch this team. But... Uh, I guess, fortunately for him, that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think he eventually ended up in America when he when he left Tottenham as well. But many, many years later, I think, yeah. And Nacho, I know that was that was a big deal in Argentina as well. Those players moving to England. What what do you remember yes. of the reaction at the time? Of course, I remember. Especially, I, I remember Sabella because he. He played in River, in River Play. That's my team. Uh, it was a bit of surprise because at that time was not like nowadays, where every player, perhaps here in South America, plays one, two champions, ch- championships, and he goes like Julian Alvarez and all the others that nowadays are playing in in, in the Premier League. But at that time was not something common and Sabella, uh, Marangoni and of course uh, because of uh, what they did uh, or, or what they want uh, Villa and Ardiles 
uh, in Tottenham. They made something special. I think that perhaps that was the seeds of what the Premier League became years late, later. Right. Definitely. So for, for this World Cup and uh, Menotti, he'd been much criticised before. Uh, now he was vindicated. How much credit is given to him for this success? I think that uh, 100%. Because when Menotti, and we talked this in, 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 in the other podcast that we discussed, when, when Menotti arrived to the national team, it was a mess. Uh, it was, there was no organization at all. And he always said this, Menotti, he says that when he arrived, what, we, what he had to do for, for the organization was to place the things where they had to be. And he always says, for example, I, I put the chairs near the table, I put the oven in the kitchen, and he explains all like that, that he placed the things where the things had to be. And that was the, the first decision that he took when he started managing the national team. And because of that, I think that Argentina became one of the most important teams from that day to nowadays. I think that perhaps he's the, uh, even thought Bilardo years later, but I think that Menotti was uh, very important at that time because he, he managed to do what he wanted to do and what he think that was better for Argentina. He, he's very clever, Menotti. He is very clever. And, well, he's now in, in the AFA, in the organization. He's one of the ones that wanted to place Escaloni as, as, uh, as, as the, the manager of Argentina. He's, he's, he's a, a very important man for, for the history of Argentine football. No doubt about it. In closing... Historically, is this the most memorable World Cup for Argentina because it's the first, or does the Maradona factor in 1986 take precedence? I, I think that there's no much justice with this team because nowadays we associate the World Cup in 1978 with the milit military government with political issues. And they try to, to put this World Cup in a small level, like the other one in, in 1986 or, well, the last one. But I think that even if there were these political issues in Argentina, I think that the team was just a football team playing and if Rensenbrink, for example, scored instead of, of hitting the bar, well, the history will be uh, very different. And I think that there was no political issue during the World Cup. I think that the Argentine team was very strong enough and it was demonstrated in, in that final very difficult final against the Dutch team. But I think that if you now make a poll in Argentina and with everybody and you said, okay, give an order to the three World Cup winning by Argentina, I'm not, I have no doubt that the World Cup in 1978 will be placed at the third stage of that podium. The first, I don't know. Uh, it will be the ones that want Messi as the most important players and the other that think that Maradona was the most important of all. But I think that if you make a poll right now, that World Cup in Argentina would be placed at the, the third 
place in the podium. Yeah, which is a shame because uh, the first one should be, you would think, would be the most memorable one. But you know. Yes, yes, of course. As I said before, I think that they try to place the political issue above the sports and that's not good enough. I think that political, we, we have we, we, we have to keep it apart and we have to read the sport as, as a sport. Sometimes it's difficult, yes, that's right, but I think that uh, we have to manage to, to, to do that, to understand uh, what was the sport at that time, the football playing in Argentina, those players, I think that they deserve to be at the up there at the same level that the, the players that won uh, last year in Qatar or in 1986 in Mexico. With that, I would like to thank you for your participation in this series. And for any questions and comments, you may contact me on Twitter and Facebook um, under Soccer Nostalgia. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on Twitter at 1888letter, and his blog is The 1888letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify, Google, Apple, and Stitcher, all under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Please leave a review, rate, and subscribe if you like the podcast. Mr. Dimari's contact info and his Twitter handle uh, at L Oleg is also listed on the blog and uh, uh, podcast listings. So thank you once again and hope to continue these discussions on the Argentine football history. Of course, you can count on me anytime. It's a pleasure to me to be here in Soccer Nostalgia, the best postcard, <laughs> no doubt, in all the World Wide Web. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Nacho.